In a great cave some miles within the edge of Mirkwood, on its eastern side there lived at this time their greatest king. Before his huge doors of stone, a river ran out of the heights of the forest and flowed on and out into the marshes at the feet of the high wooded lands. The idea that emerged was that it would like be like being in a forest except you're underground. Over thousands of years, they've carved the stalactites and stalagmites into shapes that represent trees to them. It is this beautifully complex mastery of the use of, of wood and earth to, to create these flying walkways and incredibly complex staircases in the underground realm. The best way to describe it would be to imagine walking down the nave of the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, but not on the floor, but 100 feet up, with the light coming in through the windows and be able to walk through those columns and uh, very colorful and grand. You know, an underground realm is only lit by, uh, by artificial light, but how do you make that something of spectacular beauty? Ah, uh, where is the light coming from? This is always the grand question, isn't it? Well, in our case, it's coming from the lighting crew, which, no, I'm kidding. Um, we're working on the premise that the caverns are not totally buried underground. There are openings that the light can filter down through. A sort of a, a very firm rule of thumb that we have is, is when we have big spaces, um, you really, you can't cheat that. You have to have lots and lots of individual light sources. You know, you've got your overall sunlight, which is reasonably ambient, but in terms of the, the, the practical, the lantern light, you know, we just have lots and lots of those light sources. The elves were living with this you know, gorgeous golden light, which was obtained through the amber bulbs. And the amber could either be um, tree sap, or it could be a, a, a living rock. There was one very important element that we needed for Thrangel's realm, and that was his throne needed to really reflect his character. We went through a lot of designs for Thranduil's throne. Oh, I don't know how many drawings we did. The idea that started to emerge most strongly was that of incorporating this kind of staghorn element. That really sprang from this little detail in the story where um, just after they've crossed the, the stream, um, a stag appears. And the implication is that the stag is a sacred animal to the, to the elves. One of the traditional features of old folklore is that the elves were associated with the uh, white deer. It's very much an association with the other world. And if you interact with it, you may stray over into its world. And that's really perilous. We find it in the stories of King Arthur, where they're at a feast. The doors are open and a stag runs right through the hall and out the other side and disappears. It's the kind of the portent of a, an adventure. You see the white stag or the white doe and naturally you think that's really strange, I'm gonna chase that. But actually that may be a trap. Thorin takes a shot at it. He's definitely kind of violated a taboo. You should have done that. It's bad luck. It seemed that this was going to be some kind of totemic or emblematic figure for, for Thrandall. And of course, Thrandall is riding a great kind of horned beast, an, an elk. At one point, Alan put two, two deer's heads on the armrests of the, of the throne. And, um, and then I did the one with the, with the huge antlers that are sculpted out on both sides of the throne. We found there was a particular uh, type of elk that existed prehistorically in Ireland that had uh, antlers that they used almost as shovels. So that became a design influence for uh, Thrangel's throne and, and we developed up this carving of these huge elk and antlers. Yeah, that was a monster. Trying to make something that large with, with that spread of antlers, I think there are about 12 foot either side, 12 feet that way and 12 feet that way. So 20, I think, yeah, it might have been a 24 foot sort of span, you know, then arched around like that. So they're, they're bloody big. Oh, yeah, I couldn't believe it when I walked into that set. I was just like, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, it's cool. Such a kind of position of power. 
It was just the throne and a path and some steps. And then you get shown the art, the concept art, for what that throne room will actually look like in the movie, and it's incredible. It was quite a, um, an interesting design process because you're faced with the difficulty of having quite small sets, which you need to put into a quite a wide environment. Uh, we basically built the things that actors needed to walk on, and uh, all the rest was done in post-production. The production built a floor. They built a low uh, dais around that floor um, that essentially was just the, the edge of the, um, the floor area. But everything else, including the columns that are on top of that low-level dais, the walkway immediately off the, the, um, the throne area, and everything beyond that is entirely digital. To really get the scope of what we wanted, there was no place you could build that big. And, and because we needed the freedom to move the camera through it, it just became more practical to create that as a digital environment.